Good morning, sir. My name is Adeswa Gilal Sage, and um, would you like to introduce yourself to well, the people listening? My name is Olusha Gwambasanjo, and good morning to you, Adeswa. Yes, sir. Um, I am truly honored to be here with you today. It has been, I feel like this is a culmination of the last 10 years of my life, uh, studying you know, history, especially African history, um, you are one of the greatest statesmen on the continent and you have single-handedly influenced the direction of multiple countries across the continent. And I was hoping to speak with you today um, just to maybe get a little bit more about your person, you know, what drove you to do, to be able to overcome the challenges you did and also how you feel about the current state of Nigeria and the continent as a whole. So although this is, you know, set up as an interview, it's more so a conversation. Uh, I always describe myself as a village boy, and really I am a village boy. I was born and brought up in a village. Yeah. As I always say to people, uh, it doesn't matter how large you make the map of Nigeria, my village will never appear on the map of Nigeria because it's uh, so small. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was going up there, uh, the number of villages, uh, the number of houses would not be more than 25. Um, mm -hmm. But the peaceful um, rural communities where um, there wasn't much that we wanted that God didn't provide mm -hmm. uh, for us. I was born of uh, a father and a mother, both of were illiterate, um, but they were good uh, parents to me. Um, and um, my father was coming back from the farm one day and he asked me, um, you, you wouldn't want to do any other thing other than going to farm with me. And I uh, said, well, uh, 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 there was a, an older cousin of my who had left the village to come to Abeokuta um, to be uh, uh, to learn to become a vehicle mechanic. Mm. And so, apart from farming, that was all another thing that I thought. So I said, "Well, uh, Papa, if you..." Let me let me learn to become a vehicle mechanic. So you would like to go to school ah, if you send me, and um, they sent you to school. He decided to bring me to Abeokuta. Mm. We went to five schools because we came late. Mm, they resumed uh, on Monday. We arrived on Tuesday, and we started going to these schools on Wednesday. To finish the admission, I went to five schools that are very close to our, uh, our compound in Abeokuta from where I could be going to school. I wasn't admitted. So, uh, my uh, uncle in law, the husband of my aunt, the senior sister, uh, senior half sister to my father, I stayed with them. Not up to three months, my father came one day and was uh, saying to my uncle-in-law, you are a lazy man. You just wake up in the morning and you go to the river uh, to catch fish. Uh, to my father, you are not uh, a hard-working man unless you are a farmer. And, uh, and uh, yeah, he was uh, quite a, a successful farmer for 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 a while. So I went back to the village and then uh, before a year a nearby uh, a village people can show me. Um, normally we had harvest towards the end of the year mm -hmm. in those days. Uh, and every village church will have harvest. So the principal, uh, sorry, the headmaster of uh, the village school, Nebukun came to me 
mucho a Philip. Uh, to attend the harvest, uh, this will be about November, because harvest doesn't go beyond uh, Christmas. Mm. And then my father talked to him, and he said, oh, yes, uh, uh, we were at, at meeting, and then on the 15th of January, uh, 1946, uh, I, went, I went to school, I became And the, near disaster uh, happened. Uh, you know, being a village boy, rural or bringing respect uh, for elders and particularly your parents. I never look at my father on the face, uh, in the face. No, not done. And um, so we went to the time to we line up. And the young teacher who was taking her uh, name for admission then, when he came to my door, he said, what's your name? I give my name. And uh, he said, what's your father's name? In my understanding, asking for my father's name is an insult. <laughs> and uh, so, of course. You I, was the teacher? Of course, I slapped him. <laughs> so, you were nine? And then, so the teacher left everything. He didn't slap me back. He then went to the headmaster. Mm -hmm. And the headmaster came and put out a bench. And he asked for people to hold me firm on the bench. And the teacher to give me six lashes. So, I was given six lashes. And the headmaster, of course, knew my father's name, gave my father's name. And uh, but for the maturity and the understanding of the headmaster, I will have only gone to school for one day. Wow. Um, I got back home, I couldn't I couldn't tell my, my story to my father, but um, it was an interesting story. And um, uh, the, 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 the teacher I slapped, he and I became the best of friends. And, uh, um, so I was going to ask, you know, growing up, you said you considered yourself a village boy and you go on to live an incredible life. I feel like you've lived many lives in one lifetime mm -hmm. that, you know, 17 people will not know. Did you have any indication at a younger age of the greatness you were going to achieve? No, no, no. I was, as I said, I, well, I got out of the village. I was, uh, well, um, in, in those days, it, this where I started school, mm. you could only go to standard two um, in those days. Um, then I became a pioneer from about four schools that uh, nearby, um, they took from standard two and established standard three and standard four. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't really have anything higher than standard four in the village area. So I, I was in standard one, and those who are going to the new school from standard two I took exam with them, I passed. So I went from standard one to standard three, mm -hmm. uh, where the new school was beginning. And then standard four, I, I had to come to Abeokuta mm -hmm. and then continued my education. education. And from standard five, I went to the secondary school, the Bishops of Abeokuta. Um, then finished there, well, uh, sort of finished there. I want to move a bit further in your life. Um, so after you joined the military, I want to know when your anti-imperial and anti-colonial sentiments and your I I, I think that really that came when I was in secondary school. It was in secondary school. Yeah, when when I was in secondary school, you know, the early fifties, mid fifties, mm. there was uh, favor for independence, yeah. uh, and then some of our teachers were. Uh, 
active. Who are active, active. In fact, uh, one of them became a minister in uh, Western region. Mm -hmm. So that favor of uh, independence uh, uh, conferences mm -hmm. about Nigeria independence. It entered you as a young Grew <laughs> into my my bones, and then my first experience, as uh, early experience, after I become an officer mm -hmm. uh, in the army, was to go to the Cameroon, um, the part of Cameroon that was British mandated territory, mm -hmm. which was administered as part of Nigeria. Um, this was before independence. And then immediately after independence, I was also uh, in the Congo. Yeah. Uh, very, very early. Uh, so all these Influence. really influenced my, uh, my, if you like, my world view yeah. about, uh, about, about Africa. Yeah. Uh, my view about uh, colonialism and uh, independence and what uh, we should have and all that. Yeah, so when you were in the Congo, um, were you influenced at all by like Patrice Lumumba's? Well, uh, Patrice Lumumba, well, I, I, I think the two of us were friends and together, uh, myself and Chukuma and Zoku, mm -hmm. we were very close, um, and we were in the same company uh, in, in the military. We were always, in fact, we, we could jolly well have lost our commission because we wrote to uh, Roberto, who was uh, um, a Congolese fighting it, uh, and why we wrote to him, because we said, well, we are supporting him, and uh, we, were, we were a bit naive, even though we were. Uh, so, and Lumumba's death, of course, was uh, a great blow. And uh, um, the Secretary General of the, of the UN then, uh, he too lost his uh, life on, uh, on account of. Uh, situation in, 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 in the Congo. So, um, well, the, the, those were the, the days of uh, real, uh, what I would call real genuine favor for independence for what Africans can do. I saw in, in, in the Congo, what you may call uh, the real underdevelopment of uh, a colonial country. We were much better than the Congo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. So it was like the first time. Not so. that we have done too well since then, but uh, <laughs> that's a different issue. Yes. Um, so you come back from the Congo and you're here for independence. No, we had independence before I went to the Congo. Oh, it was before you went to the Congo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In fact, uh, we were prepared, but we couldn't go um, because we were so. On the first of October, by the middle of October, we were uh, have joined the what they call the advance party uh, to go to the Congo. Why we were preparing for independence, we were also preparing our luggage for the Congo. So, but we couldn't take part. Ghana, Mali, they have taken part ahead of us uh, because they were, of course, Ghana was uh, uh, at least two, two years ahead of us. Okay. Mali was uh, a few months ahead of us, but they were ahead of us so they could go. We couldn't go until we became independent. Mm -hmm. But we are we are the airmap. 
when you were in the Congo, I read that you had you were captured at some point in time. No, it, it wasn't captured. I tell you what happened. We there was a monastery, mm. and there, it, it was uh, a female monastery. Okay. And um, you know what the Roman Catholic uh, usually do. This, this monastery was in, in an isolated area, but um, uh, it, uh, it, it was fairly well furnished, well, uh, you know. But then, uh, anxiety started developing about their safety mm -hmm. uh, because. Uh, so I was uh, assigned yeah. to go and evacuate them to Bukavu. But to do that, I had to go in and do what we call reconnaissance, wrecking. So in the course of my reconnaissance to know where they are and that they know they see me and all that, the Congolese soldiers nearby got the wind and then they arrested me um, and they put me in the boot of a car. Like a small boot? Mm. Oh. Mm. Were you afraid at that time? Well, I, well, well what, uh, what can I do? If soldiers arrest you, they arrest you. What, what can you do? And then, but I was popular in Bukavu. Uh, Shukuma and Zogu and I, we were, we were not drinking, we were not smoking. Um, and we normally get uh, cigarettes from what we call the UN mm -hmm. uh, supply. So I'm always with cigarette in my pocket. Okay. And uh, whenever I go, um, uh, I offer to Kukuli soldiers and their officers. I always make sure it's only one that come out because uh, they want to take more than one. <laughs> so I was very popular. Uh, let now, but let now, but that's how they call me. So when I was arrested, um, rather than shoot me, uh, they decided to go to. There was uh, a cement factory not too far away. And that cement factory had a telephone. So they went to the cement factory and phoned their headquarters in Bukavu. And then they said, the, the Bukavu uh, headquarters said, who is this uh, UN peacekeeping officer? Mm -hmm. And they came to ask me, I said, tell them let now back. Let Naba, let Naba bring him to uh, Bukavu. And uh, no harm should be done to him. So they knew that uh, uh, I'm not just an ordinary man, <laughs> not just an ordinary officer, that I have a little bit of. Uh, yeah, so class, they, yeah. yeah, so they brought me out of the. <laughs> so now they took you in the car to book out uh, with my. Uh, they put me when they put me in the boot. They didn't put my interpreter because I I don't speak uh, uh, French. French yeah. um, so I always uh, went around with an interpreter. So that's what happened. And when we got to Bukavu, the Nigerian soldiers were furious that their officer was arrested and put in the boot. So the, the, I was uh, debriefed and um, they said, no, the following morning, we must go and arrest those Congolese uh, soldiers. So we went 5 a.m., set out. By seven, as they were waking up, they were waking up into our hands. <laughs> and then we brought some of them to our own camp. And uh, uh, after some
of them uh, after some time they were released and they had left Jesus was one. So you've always been relatively popular then. You use um, well, I, I don't know. Well, if we look back, I don't know. Why, what, what do you do in a situation like that? Um, you are in a place to make peace. Mm. Um, you cannot be antagonistic. Mm. You, you, you must make friends. Uh, but when you are making friends in a situation where you are making peace, you shouldn't uh, become too familiar. Because if you become too familiar, you then lose the, uh, the like your value of your yeah. being, your neutral, absolutely. being uh, impartial, mm -hmm. being firm, and all that. So uh, I was fairly friendly with everybody. And um, uh, as I said, my colleague and friend, uh, we were thinking about Africa, what can we do? Uh, yeah. We were a little bit ahead of our, our age, I would say. And at this time, you were in your, you were about 30s? Or you were not yet 30s? We were talking of 1960, 61. Yeah, 1961, so you were not 30 years. 24. Wow. And you carry, so you're very young when this is happening. And you carry the same passion and passion for Africa when you go to Sudan. Because, you know, you make a lot of friends there. Um, you, you fight for the black people who are there. Um, and also in your, in the Murtala Obasanjo administration in 75, um, it seems the Issue. Yeah, but you cannot make peace by being antagonistic. Mm. If you are going to be a peace a, a peacemaker, you have to be friendly. You have to learn to understand the factors yes. that are at play. There's no doubt that whichever way you look at it, colonialism is anti-African. Mm. So, there's no friendship between colonial master and colonial subject, yeah. really. But if you are a colonial subject and I'm a colonial subject, we are victims together. Mm -hmm. As you understand your situation, you should understand my situation. What can we bring to the table? Um, and that, so if I went to Cameroon, I went to the Congo, I went to Sudan, where I went to uh, South Africa yeah. uh, as a member of feminine persons group. So, You're now, the first all, black person. All, all, all that must be uh, because we are birds of the same feather mm. and we have to flock together. Um, mm. Um, and one way without bitterness, um, uh, slave trade, colonialism, neo-colonialism, what even they call globalization now, they are all to the detriment of all Africa. Do we understand it that way? If we understand it that way, then what do we have to do? Are we doing what we should do? which we are not. Um, uh, and therefore, because we are not doing what we should do, we remain almost perpetually subjugated. Subjugated. Yeah. Because we are, uh, after independence, like some people said, we got flood independence. But we didn't get what I would call um, Independence in our thought, independence in our uh, behavior, independence in our action, in our orientation and action. Do you think we have it now, um, 
this idea of independence in our thoughts where a lot of Nigerian schools don't even teach history. The most I learned about Nigerian history was outside of Nigeria. Um, when I went to school in Nigeria, I learned the same history that you said you learned. I learned about Henry VIII and his wives. I learned about Mongo Park. I learned about Queen um, Elizabeth. I, I, I believe that is a, that, that, that's a, 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 an unfortunate situation. You see, we are. I, I was shocked when I heard that history is no longer taught, mm. whether it's uh, whatever form of history in our schools. I don't know who brought that about, but who brought, whoever brought that about has done us a great disservice. Mm. You see, my dear sister, history is like memory. If you don't have a memory, you won't even remember what you ate last night. And if you don't remember the past, how can your past influence your present? And how can your present and your past help you to plan for the future? Mm -hmm. And like we were saying, look, if African leaders don't realize and don't know that whatever comes from their colonial master, even today, it will be in the best interest of the colonial master. And if their own interest is taken into account at all, mm -hmm. it will be very small. Yeah. All right. If you know that from history, and as I said to you, colonialism is suppress Africa, exploit Africa for benefit of colonial power. Yeah. Well, go first to slave trade, where we lost up not less than 10 million people on, uh, on the Atlantic. Yeah. And um, what do we get out of it? We were partly, partly contributory. With our intertribal, intratribal, and uh, interethnic wars, and we capture ourselves as souls. And, um, um, then neocolonialism, all sorts of things will come up. World Bank came at one time, they thought, with uh, structural adjustment. What structure are you adjusting when you don't even any, have any structure? And you are talking of structural adjustment. They bring this thing to us, we yeah. take it up and swallow it, hook, line, and sinker. I remember when I went to study South African history, I actually lived in South Africa, and there were only two of us who were African on the program. Me and my roommate, she's Eritrean. Her name is Johanna because she was born um, after the Civil War when Eritrea got its independence. And nearly every night we would cry it was a very emotional experience for us being in south africa and i had read that you said that the liberation of southern africa like the removal of minority rule everywhere in africa was an emotional and personal thing. well it is personal to me because you see whatever else i am i am diminished if anywhere in the world, any man or woman is regarded as a second class citizen, either in the world or in her own environment, as a result of color of their skin. Color of her skin. Because if he shares the color the same color with me mm. and is regarded as second class citizen or second class human being. Mm -hmm. I'm, then I'm in the same class. So why should I accept that? Mm. My dear sister, I was in class with white people and I beat them. Yes. So why, why, why should I be treated? And if, I'm, if, if anybody tried to treat me uh, that way, why should I accept it? Why shouldn't I fight it? Mm. 
And so to me, it is personal. And um, uh, it, it is also a passion. Uh, I'm passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And like you said, I bring my own religion into it. God created us equal. And then, of course, when you go, go into anthropology, life, human life begins in Africa. Yeah. So they went everywhere else. Uh, if all that is accepted, for what reason should I accept being treated as second, a, class. second class human being in this world yeah. or second class citizen yeah. uh, anywhere? So for me, and if you say for you and, and that, people ask me, why do you, uh, are you so uh, uh, passionate about this thing? Because it, it, I can, it should not be accepted. Yeah. And like you rightly said, when you take our own history, our own culture, there's so many good things about ours. So, so many. So many good things about us. Now, um, you know, we, we have no word for uh, uncle, uh, cousin, nephew, uh, needs. So, it is my daughter, my son, my sister's children. I dare not refer to them as my sister children. They are my children. Um, that type of life is the type of life God wants us to live. Communalism, if you like togetherness, if you like, love, if you like. And then, why should I throw that away and pick, well, if you are uh, my son or my daughter, and you are 18 years old of, of, of age, you are... You should leave the house. You should leave the house. It's foreign to our culture. Okay. And now, whereas the beauty of us is to together. be close together. Yes. And when I get old, I go to stay with uh, uh, a child and looking after my grandchildren or great-grandchildren if I live up to that. Now, what is wrong with that? That is what uh, uh, life, life is all about. Yes. That's what life is all about. So, um, and then take the Yoruba language. It's the richest language in the world, I dare say, with greetings. Yeah. Yoruba language will greet you. They have greetings for when, even when you sit down. They could go. <laughs> English language it doesn't have a good joke. Yoruba language have greeting even when you are sleeping. <laughs> As G. Now does does he expect you to answer? If you answer, then you are not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and does he expect you to answer? But they are beautiful things. Mm -hmm. If you are having your bath, there's greeting. I will know. Now, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And, um, you know, talking about these things, I, I had, uh, actually, we were first cousin, but he was older than my father. And when I was in Nevada, he came to see me. And I was taking him to the garage. And uh, a friend of mine was then a, 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 a colonel. A friend of mine then saw me and said, oh, colonel, it was on a Sunday. Um, I, I, I thought I would come and see you after service. That you are going out. I said, oh, yes, I, I will come back soon. I'm taking my uncle to the garage. He came from Lagos, you know. For seven years, he never talked to me. 
Because you call it your own cause. Because I call it my cause. I should have said, I'm taking my father to the garage. For seven years, I have to I, I plead, plead, I have to beg, I have to apologize. And, um, and that is where. And when any time people ask him, say, look, he called me uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? <laughs> he called me uncle. Mm. On a very serious note, these are some of the things that make life uh, uh, what I believe God wants it to be. Yes, and what truly are. I want to ask um, about the end of, it's 1979, when you hand over power and you refuse a, a government car and you drive yourself back home with Shehu uh, Yardua and Eve in the car. Mm, the Shehu saw me. Oh, he saw you home. Um, <coughs> what did you guys talk about? What was, what, how were you feeling? Like, what was... No, 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 I, I, I felt, I felt happy. I've done what I should do. We came, we said, look, we would do this. We did it. Mm. And um, we went back home. And I came back home. I rested for uh, one week. And the second week, I started my family. Mm. Did you have any anxieties about the future of Nigeria? I did not. I, I did not. I must confess to you. So when we had somebody like uh, Abacha, mm. I, I, it, it was like a daydream to me. Could Nigeria descend to this? Because that was not our hope. That was not our expectation. After the Civil War, and with what we did, and to uh, find the wounds and uh, bring unity and all that, and all that. And we, we thought, oh, this is an aberration. Oh, how did this come about? Um, and then, of course, we had, I, I had opportunity after that to come back as an elected president. Yeah. Um, we, are, we went back to do what we have done before uh, uh, again. Did you go back with the same mindset? Because this is 20 years apart and so much has happened. The country is so different. Like, you personally, did you feel the same? Did you feel excited? Were you, you know, sad? No, I, like, I, I, I thought that uh, God had uh, provided an opportunity for us to right the wrongs of the past 20 years, mm. um, which should be dead. Uh, me, uh, I wanted, when, when I came back as elected president, um, I wanted somebody who could take care of the military so that I won't have to worry myself about that. I've had 20 years in Tarebium of meeting some of the best people in the world of politics, mm -hmm. in the world of di diplomacy, in every uh, uh, walks of life. Uh, Mushmit, Biatrudo, Jimmy Kalan, all, all these people. Uh, uh, we, 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 I, I, belo I belong to a group called Linux Club. Interaction Council of former heads of government. Yes. And um, and I learned a lot from them. And we learned from ourselves. Uh, and um, in fact, their own idea was that I should go to the UN. That look. To be Secretary General. Yeah, yeah. Secretary General. Um, and uh, they we tried to uh, influence that. But I came back, and um, the, the, the first thing that was of concern to me was who could handle the military for me. Yeah. So I invited 
my former colleague, Jacob Danjuma, and who, of course, I know, uh, Biko. Uh, of course, in the, in the process, he, he, he took ill, and that, uh, I think, after about two years, it affected his uh, ability. But you see, that, that was part of what, uh, the way I, I, I look at what I had to do. Okay, the military had degenerated. Now, who can handle that for me? Mm. Um, while I'm dealing with um, the country, the, the, politi the, the, the political, the economic, mm. uh, the social, um, the foreign, uh, foreign relations or foreign, foreign policy. Relations. You know, um, with Dan Juma, he visited you when you were in, in prison in Yula. He did. And um, you write in your book that um, it was a very emotional meeting. A very emotional. He wept. He wept. And I was the one to tell him that, look, Jacob, look, uh, two of them visited me that I will remember. Jacob and you know, visited me. Mm -hmm. You, Garuba, too, visited me. Mm. Yeah. Garuba was your foreign secretary when you were. Mm. Garuba was the, the foreign. Garuba was the foreign secretary. Foreign secretary. When, foreign secretary, I, was, secretary, when, when I was military head of state. Yeah. Mm. Um, the night that you were arrested, you know, when it was orchestrated by Abacha, um, Atiku Abubakar was with you. Atiku Abubakar. See me and gone. He had he had seen you and gone that night. That that is the morning. Oh, in the morning, and um, he came to because I wasn't in when uh, she was arrested before me. Yeah, she was arrested. I wasn't in, so I came back, and um, uh, Atiku Abubaka came to uh, brief me on what had happened yeah. and. and uh, uh, of course, I was not to have come in because the Americans have offered me an asylum. They knew that I would be arrested mm -hmm. and I've been warned uh, that I, look, I haven't done anything wrong. So they will arrest me, let them arrest me. Um, you wrote that because of the trade of arms you had taken, that you knew that life and liberty could be taken at any point. Did, did that, like, did your lack of thinking about your own personal mortality, did that help you in, you know, fighting for other people and chasing what you believe was right? Well, no, I think, look, the, 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 one thing that is sure about life is death. Mm. You may not be sure of any other thing. The only thing that you may not know about death is when and how. So, so it just, it didn't matter to you? That's a very, it's very incredible because, you know, as somebody who's observing from the outside, brushing, coming to brushes with death in Congo, you know, surviving the civil war, then being, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to prison. Going to prison. But even before that, you survived the Demka coup. Hmm? You survived the coup. Um, yes. And then you went to prison. And in prison, um, I believe, Kirikiri, was that the last time you saw um, Sherry Adwell? Yeah, we met, uh, we met in, um, in Kirikiri. Now, he, <clears throat> he was in Kirikiri before me. Mm. And then <clears throat> when they gave my own judgment or verdict, as uh, whichever way you look, uh, call it, uh, and took me to Kirikiri, they put me in the same uh, age. The, the hospital, yeah. and they have not opened it. They put both of us there, and now we were there for, I think, three nights or, or four nights. I can't remember now. So he was then taken to Port Accord. Mm -hmm. I was taken, taken to, to Jones. Um, was there any sense of foreboding when you guys spent those like last days together? Did you guys mostly talk about Nigeria, or did you get? Oh yes, we did. We did. We did. And um, he. He said he had a company. I don't know whether I wrote that in my book. He did, Intel's. 
that he had with um, Elijah to go with Elijah. Yeah. It tells. Yeah. And Elijah yeah. had two thousand sheep. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Shad did uh, give him, he, he took his uh, substantial share, he gave a bit of it to Emma Okano. And um, um, she would have said to me, Look, where, where he told me that, I said, if he's done this, he's not expecting you to come back. And he said, Well, I believe I will come back, and if I come back, I will get my company back. Of course, he didn't come back, mm -hmm. but I got the company back. So he saw, saw his army. Like his army. When you heard about his passing, how did that affect you? Well, I, people who knew, we, we exchanged a couple of letters from, so, uh, uh, people who knew what was going on and all that, knew that it was an person, mm. and that actually where he was posing, I was supposed to be posing. Mm. And the doctor, I understand he was in fact jailed or arrested, whatever it may be, because he mishandled my own being. Your own poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> so they punished him for not being able to poison you. Wow. And what he did was, he came to George uh, prison, mm. and he um, took me out of the prison. He took me to a guest house in the GRA. A girl's house. A guest house. Oh, a guest house. Guest, house. Okay. guest house. And he said, "Oh, look, we know you have. He has this needle, which is what they did to show Yaradra, which is." Uh, already poisoned, mm. it was, uh, the idea was to inject. So he said he wanted to take your blood. my blood mm. because um, I have, they, they hear that I have cholesterol. Uh -huh. I said, no, I don't have cholesterol, <laughs> I'm diabetic. But uh, I do, and I have my uh, instrument for mm. measuring. I said, look, I'm God. I've taken care of my diabetes in, in prison, so, so you won't touch me. Mm. So that was what saved me. Mm. So then he said, well, when you get to where you are going, um, they will come again. Wow. So when I got to Yola, within the third day, I told the prison superintendent, I said, look, I am diabetic. I'm diabetic. I want to see a doctor. a doctor. And they call a doctor who was a specialist in Yola General Hospital, who happened to be a Yoruba man, mm. a Juma, and who seemed to have known a lot about me. So he came and I told him what had happened. He said, Look, for diabetes, um, you are doing right, keep uh, doing what you are doing. But if anybody comes to say they are taking your blood, tell the prison superintendent to call me. Mm -hmm. And they came as they promised. And um, so Dr. Juan was called, he came, and Dr. Juan then said to him, Look, what do you want? He said, blood. Oh, Dr. Ajuan said, no, 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 I will give you the blood. So Dr. Ajuan okay. took the blood. Okay. And he said, well, when are we going to hear the result? He said, as soon as I get to Abuja. <laughs> My sister, we haven't had the result till today. <laughs> oh, wow. It's, I mean, I feel like you show, you, know, you have a very good sense of humor about people trying to kill you multiple times in your life. <laughs> on the off field. How many times should I have died? <laughs> that, 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 that's the way to look at it. And I'm seriously, mm -hmm. I used to say, and I, I've said it even this morning, that God has been partial to me in the way he has looked after me, the way he has taken care of me. 
because, like I've said, there are many occasions that I, I, I should have died. I should have died during the civil war. So, if I show you where I had to wound during the civil war, you'll be surprised. But no, I survived it. You survived it. I survived it. And you also. Uh, Ab Abacha. Abacha's intention, if in fact he told Larry Shekola after we have been in prison, that three of us will not come out of prison or detention alive. And the three of us are myself, uh, Shewi Aradwa, and uh, MK Oakala. You're the only one who made it. And you Why did I make it? Not because of my goodness, not because of my power, not because of my grace of God. Mm. And you also outlived the man who was trying to kill you. If anybody had gone to him a year before he died, that look, that man of Basanjo will be sitting in your city within less than a year after you die. He will have asked that man to be killed and me to be killed. Mm. Well, thank God, only God knows the future. Only God knows the future. Only God knows. knows. Um, when I feel like a lot of people know about your time in prison, or at least if you read your book. Mm. But I, wrote, in, I wrote something about my time. Yes, yeah, so you've written about your time in prison, but you don't. Um, but a lot of people don't really know about the time that you spent in isolation before, you know, Jimmy Carter came and fought mm -hmm. for you in the bunker. Mm -hmm. That was bad. Mm -hmm. uh, um, <clears throat> it was a, uh, a bungalow in Nikui. They put me there. That's, um, that, that was uh, very, very, very uh, terrible. My, my family could not know where I was. I could not reach out to my family or anybody. Uh, but when Jimmy Kata came, then they brought me back to my farm, mm. uh, which was uh, more civilized. And they put you on house arrest. Do you feel, because I often feel that great men like yourself who sacrificed a lot for the liberation of their people, um, whether it be, you know, against racial subjugation, whether it be anti-colonial agitation, often end up suffering in their personal lives. Do you that feel is, that, like that, 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 that there's nothing to worry about that? Um, if you believe in a cause, you should be ready to suffer. Make any contribution to that cause. In fact, a cause that you believe in that doesn't cost you any sacrifice is not worth it. Mm. Must be. It's like love. You have say I love you, I love you. Then what am I making? What is my contribution? Love that does not uh, take a bit of sacrifice from you. Look at, for God so loved the world, mm. and what did he do? He gave, he gave. Only himself. So for you, what is your great love? Love? Yeah, what is your great love? Like, if you look back on your life, like, what does love Humanity. mean to you? Humanity. Humanity and, and God. And you can love God or love unless you love humanity. If you love humanity, you will love God. And if you love humanity, there's nothing that will be too, too costly for you to do for humanity. Now that we are in 2023, mm -hmm. nearly 50 years after your administration of 75, 79, which people often say is the last time that Nigerians really stood with, with pride for a very long time, like, Nigeria was Africa's big brother. Looking back, how do you feel about the state of Nigeria now? And do you feel I believe, that I believe Nigeria is a pitiful situation. But the good thing about Nigeria that I know is that if we get the right uh, set of people in position, 
in two years we will, we will start seeing it in Nigeria. In two years. You think so? Oh yeah. Look, the, the things are there. Um, you look at Nigerians all over the world. Today we have three development banks in Africa. Mm -hmm. African Development Bank, African Bank, and the one I established, AFC, African Financial uh, um, uh, Financial okay. whatever it is, but AFC. In those, the chief executives of these three banks are Nigerian. Mm. WTO, a Nigerian lady is in charge. The UN, this number two person there is a Nigerian lady mm. who I discovered. And, oh, no. yeah. and so you have Nigerian of world standard everywhere. So why are we underperforming the leadership? Thank you so much, sir. Come and take this in a way now. <laughs> you are young enough.